Okay, welcome to another video. Today we're going to take a look at a distribution that's made specifically for the Raspberry Pi, which I wasn't actually aware of until a member of my Discord server pointed it out to me, and that is Twister OS. Now I'm quite happy that I was made aware of this one, because looking on their website and going through the gallery and the About Me page, there's quite a lot for us to take a look at which should be quite interesting. So of course it's based on Raspbian and it uses XFCE as its desktop environment. So we've booted up for the first time off an SD card, so let's take a look around. Right, so here we are, and the first thing we are greeted with is the Welcome to Twister OS welcome screen. So let's run through this very quickly and do the initial setup. So we've got some Raspberry Pi configuration, launch Raspberry Pi configuration to set your password, time zone, language, preferences, Wi-Fi country, and enable or disable overscan, and that's to do with your display. So I can see that our time zone is currently incorrect, so we're going to run through all of these steps now by pressing let's go. So it's going to pop open a little window here, and then it's going to open up the Raspberry Pi configuration. So first of all, we're going to change the password. I do believe the default is Raspberry, so we're going to just change that to something more useful. Okay. So that has now changed the password. And next up, we're going to jump straight into the display, but before we do, is there anything else I want to do in here? So we can set the way it boots up, so we can go straight to the desktop or a CLI. So we're going to leave that as default. Network app boot, we shall not wait, and splash screen we will enable, and power LED, we'll leave that on constant. So jumping over to display now, I don't think there's going to be too much we're going to really need to do here, because I can already see that there's no issues with overscanning on this display. So next up we have interfaces. So we have things for our camera, SSH, VNC, SPI, and a few other things here like your serial port and consoles. Again, I'm not gonna worry about any of that for now, so we're gonna skip over to performance. Okay, so what can we do here? We can do some overclocking, change the GPU memory, overlay file system, fan. So we've disabled the fan there, the GPIO and fan temperature. So again, we're just gonna leave that as it is. And here's where we're going to set the localization and time zone and all of that good stuff. So locale, we want GB, I'm going to imagine. So language, E in English, country, we want GB for the country, which is going to be right about there. Now we don't want it to be ISO, we want UTF-8, so we're going to drop down to UTF-8. And then we can move to the next step, which is the time zone. So at the moment it says it's a 5 past 10, which is definitely not the time. So let's go ahead and set our time zone. So we want Europe, so we should just be able to press E. We can't, so let's just scroll down to Europe. And then we want London. There it is, okay. Right, so that's now setting the time zone. And then last but not least, we have the set keyboard. Oh, we also have Wi-Fi country as well. So let's do these two. So we want the layout to be English UK, and we're gonna leave it on like that. So that should be okay. We'll test out the keyboard layout once we're actually finished with this welcome screen, okay. And then the last step we have is a Wi-Fi country. So again, we're going to want UK or GB. So let's scroll down until we find it. It's going to probably be in GB. Britain, UK. Perfect. Okay, so I think that's pretty much everything we need to do in the welcome screen for this part. So let's click OK and see if that's going to set it all. So the changes you've made do require the Raspberry Pi to reboot to take effect. So we're going to do that now. I'll pause the video here and we'll be back in just a moment. Okay, so we're back and it appears that those changes have taken effect. As we can see in the top right, our time zone is now set to the correct time. So before we continue with the welcome screen to see if there's anything else that we might have missed, we're going to open up a terminal window and just test that our keyboard layout has set correctly. So we're going to test it out with a couple of symbols as well as the at sign and everything appears to be working as it should. So we're just gonna exit this window and continue with the welcome screen. So we can go next. So we can skip this part now that we've already done the Raspberry Pi configuration. And now we've reached the update your system. So let's go ahead and press update and that will also apply the latest patch. So as you can see there, we are already on the current and latest version, which is version 1.9.7. So we can close that and then continue with the welcome screen. Okay, so we are ready to go, but we can also choose our theme here, and we are gonna look at these themes individually. I do believe there's eight, so we're gonna check them out now. So let's go to choose theme. So, want a different look? This will change your current theme. So let's press next and see what we've got. So we do have eight there, and we are currently on the default, which is Twister OS, which is a pretty standard kind of XFCE layout with a panel at the top. And I think this is also a panel, it is indeed. So that's using XFCE paneling systems. So let's test out a Raspbian 95, which is gonna have that sort of XP uh, Windows 95 kind of look and feel. 
So the system will now reboot. So we're gonna to have to reboot for those changes to take full effect. Let's do that now. Okay, we are back and you can see that everything looks a little bit different there and even our text looks a little bit pixely. Now it did change the startup time and I wasn't a huge fan of the startup time so I'm probably gonna dis disable most of the system sounds. So a single little panel here and our application launcher has got the nice little start bar button there and everything is looking pretty old school. So let's open up a terminal window and see how that looks with this theming. There we go, so super old school. And let's also open up our files manager, which should be Funa. So let's go ahead and open up the Funa file manager. And there we go. So not my kind of theme. I wouldn't really stay on this long. So we're going to switch over to one of the others now. But it's an interesting inclusion. So we're going to just go next, next. In fact, we have the theme twister here. Let's open that and just do it straight from here. Perfect. So that was Raspbian 95. Let's check out the XP version now. So again, we're probably going to have to do a reboot for it to take full effect. And then we can check out how it themes that as well. So I can already see the new icons. So we're going to enter and be back in a moment. Okay, we are back and we have that classic kind of Windows XP startup sound with this one as well. Now this actually looks pretty almost identical to what you would get from a default kind of Windows XP install. Even the colors look pretty much identical to me with the blue taskbar and the green start button. So let's open up the same sort of applications and see how that looks with this theming. But again, we're not going to spend too much time on this theme either. So it's even changed our web browser icon there to the Internet Explorer logo. So again, let's open up the terminal and let's also open up the Funar file manager. There we go. I'm not too sure I'm a massive fan of these folder icons. They don't look quite the right shape, at least to me. It's been a while since I've checked out XP though. But there we go. So again, we're going to check out one of the different ones now. So I think that's most of the XP sort of Windowsy kind of ones. There's probably like a Windows 7 one as well. Let's have a look. So let's open up the Theme Twister once more. So we now have Nighthawk, which looking at that does look like a Windows 10, Windows 7 -y kind of vibe. So let's go ahead and enable Nighthawk. Reboot and then check out this theme as well. Okay, so we are back with the Nighthawk theme and it does have a sort of Windowsy kind of design there and it's even changed the logos there for things like email clients and sort of office applications to the Microsoft Office sort of counterparts. So you've got the LibreOffice writer there using the Microsoft Word icon and you've got your email client using the Outlook icon. So what we're going to do again is open up the Files Manager and we're going to check out the terminal window and we're also going to see if the start bar is any different. So let's open up our terminal window. There we go. So it's quite a nice dark theme there and I prefer these folder icons to the ones that we saw previously. So let's close these off now and check out the application launcher. Okay, so I do believe that is the whisker menu. So if we go into the panel preferences, we can just see what items we do have here. So it is indeed the whisker menu. Now there's a separator in front of it. I'm not too sure why. I'm not a massive fan of a gap there, but we could remove that if we wanted to. So we've got all of our categories to the left and then the sort of main panel of applications to the right. Okay, not too bad. So we're gonna go straight back into the theme twister and then check out a couple of the last ones. So I think we've done four now, so we can move on to the bottom row and we have Raspbian X, iRaspbian, Dark and Light, which are your sort of Mac OS-y kind of things. And then we have Raspbian 7, which is a Windows 7 kind of look. So let's check out Raspbian X. I don't think it's going to be too different from the Nighthawk, apart from it's going to be using a more of a lighter theme for the application windows. So let's quickly check that one out and then move on to the Mac OS -y kind of ones. Okay, and we are back. So it does appear to be pretty much identical to the previous theme, apart from it's going to be using the lighter theme variation for the application windows. So let's quickly open up the file manager and the terminal window again and even our text editor has the sort of windows sort of classic notepad look and it's going to be using mousepad and to be fair that does look pretty identical to what you would get from the um notepad what's it called on windows notepad yeah to what you'd get on windows and our application launcher is the same with the dark theming there so now we're going to test out some of these mac os -y kind of ones and then last but not least we'll check out the windows 7 one so we're going to go for iRaspbian, which is going to be the light variation. And that's going to give us a dock at the bottom. I'll be interested to see if it uses a dock like Plank or it uses a paneling system. So we're going to reboot and check that one out now. Okay, we are back and it appears to be more of a Catalina kind of theme as opposed to Big Sur. And they've done quite a good job there actually. It looks pretty much like you would expect a Mac OS Big Sur to look. So the first thing I want to check out is what we're using at the bottom here. Is it a panel or is it a plank? So we're going to go into the preferences and it is indeed plank and it's using the theme Catalina with icon zoom off. So we're going to leave that off. 
So we're going to open a few windows and see how that all looks. And I think we might even have a global menu at the top. So let's open up the file manager with the uh, Mac OS Finder icon. And we do indeed have the global menu at the top there. So let's also open up our web browser. So I do believe there's two web browsers on here. We have Chromium Media Edition and I think we have just normal Chromium. But they should all also work with the global menu as you can see. And it's also got all of our sort of Windows title bar actions to the left of the application window. Let's also open up our terminal and see what that looks like with this new theme. Okay, not too bad. So what we're going to do now is check out the dark theme and then we'll check out the Windows one and then we'll check out everything else that's on this desktop. Okay, so here we are on the Mac OS Catalina dark kind of theme. And actually, I think I quite like this one. I'm not usually a huge fan of like look-alikey themes, but this one has done quite a good job of mimicking that kind of look and feel. So we've got a panel at the top again, and of course we have our plank at the bottom. So it's going to be using the same theme, but the dark variation. As you can see there, it's Catalina Dark. Now the panel has got a bit of transparency from what I can see, and also so do our context menus. So if we go into the panel preferences and jump into the appearance, we're using Alpha 70. Okay, so let's close that. And do we have a launch pad? We do. It's called Light Pad. So let's check out Light Pad. It took a couple of seconds there to actually open it up, but there is your full screen application launcher to be a bit like Launchpad from what you'd find on Mac OS. And we, of course, can traverse the pages by pressing these little dots at the bottom. And as you can see, there is a lot pre-installed that we'll go into in just a moment. And we have our search bar at the top. So let's test that out with Chrome. And there is the Chromium web browser as well as the Media Edition. It doesn't appear to have the correct icon, though, for this Media Edition in this theme. So if we just go into our appearance settings, it does take a second or two for this to actually open up the application menu here. So we're going to go straight to the settings manager and jump into appearance, which is right about there. And then we're going to check out what the name of these actual icons is as well. So yeah, it's the Catalina dark icons. And while we're in here, let's see what else we've got. So we've got quite a bit actually. So of course we have all of the Windows 7 stuff. We have Pixflat, Tango, Gnome, Catalina and Adwata. So what we're going to do now is check out the last theme, which is the Windows 7 theme. And here is our files manager with the dark theme. And I actually quite like the icons there as well. So what we're going to do is for the last time and jump into the theme switcher, which appears to have moved its position to the top now. And we're going to go next and we're going to check out the very last one, which is the Windows 7 kind of theme. OK, and here we are. And of course, we did have that Windows 7 styled startup sound as well. So the taskbar looks a little bit bigger than what I'd want it to be. But if we go into the panel preferences, we can see what's going on here. So they've done quite good on the windows there. It does actually look like a traditional Windows 7 theme. So if we go into the appearance, we are now on Alpha 80, and if we go into the items, we can see not too much has really changed here. We, of course, are still using the Whisker menu, and let's see how that's themed. Okay, that's not too bad. So the categories are on the right here, and now your full panel of applications is going to be to the left with some sort of action buttons like log out, restart, etc. at the bottom right. And can we click on that? We cannot. No, we can. So that's going to open up Mugshot, as you would expect, where you can change things like your first name, email address, and all of that good stuff. So let's have a look at some applications now in this theme. So let's open up uh, the Chromium web browser, which of course has the Internet Explorer icon. Let's open up Notepad and let's open up our terminal emulator. And here we go. So again, it's done a very good job at mim mimicking the kind of theming that you would expect from Windows 7. Like I said, though, I'm not a huge kind of looky like theme kind of guy. So we're going to leave it on the default. But I do think they have done a good job with most of these themes there to get it to look like what you'd expect these operating systems to look like. So for the last time, we're going to open up the FEMA, go to next, and we're going to leave it on the default. And now we can take a look at the overall desktop. OK, so now that we are done with the welcome screen and taking a look at some of the theming, we're going to start taking a look at some of the features that are baked into Twister OS. So if we jump onto the About Me page, there's quite a lot of interesting stuff going on here. So as you can see, we have Box86, which is an emulator to run x86 applications on ARM-based CPUs or SBCs, which stands for Single Board Computers which is your Raspberry Pi. It also includes Wine and in conjunction with Box86 will allow you to run x86 Windows software on your Raspberry Pi. And then we have things like Lutris, RetroPie, and a load of cool stuff that we're going to take a look at in just a moment. So we're going to start with the application launcher and take a look at anything that we find interesting. So in accessories, we of course have about Twister OS, which will give you some information about your system. As you can see, we're running on the Pi 400 or 1.0 and we've got 4 GB memory. 
let's keep going. So we then have our archive manager. We have Etcher, which will let you create bootable USBs from ISOs. We have Bookshelf, Bulk Rename, Calendar, Catfish File Search, Clipman, Commander Pi. So let's open up Commander Pi. So here it's going to give you a bit more system information. And as you can see in operating mode, we are using a 32-bit ISO. I do believe they only actually ship 32-bit ISOs. But if we go into the advanced tools, we can also check CPU details, bootloader network, and then set some overclocking. Let's keep going. So what else have we got? So we do also have a Debian reference and disks, which is going to be GNOME disks, I would imagine. It is indeed. Let's keep going. We then have G-Calculator LeafPad. So we have two text editors. We have LeafPad and MousePad. And then we have My Android, which is SRCPY, which is if you plug in your Android phone with a USB cable, you'll then be able to mirror your Android phone on your computer screen in its own little window and use it on your computer, much like you would have the phone in your actual hand. We then have Notes, Notification Center, PZIP, and Pi Apps. Let's open up Pi Apps. It takes a little second to open, it appears. There we go. So, categories added, report bugs if you find any. So, we have editors, eye candy, games, internet, tools, and cordless. So, if we go into internet, it will open up that category. And then, as you can see there, we can then go through some of this stuff that we might want to add or remove. So, we have browse sh, which is a terminal based uh, internet sort of web browser. But I do believe you need to have Firefox installed for it to actually work because it uses Firefox, but then you can. It's quite a good um, web browser for the terminal, actually. I've used it a little bit on my own personal machines. Email checkup, Puffin Browser Demo, Speed Test CLI, the Tor Browser, Vivaldi or WhatsApp, YouTube Buddy, and Zoom. So you could go through all of those app, uh, sort of application categories and see if there's anything you wanted to add or remove. But we're going to leave it on the defaults for now and then keep moving through accessories. So that was Pi Apps. We then have Pi Kiss. We have Plank, which is the dock that we was utilizing when we was in the Mac OS kind of themes. QJoy, Pad, Raspberry Pi Diagnostic, Screenshot, SD Card Copier, Sensor Viewer, Spotlight, Task Manager, Funar for your File Manager, and then we have X, um, X Archiver and XF Burn. So X Archiver is an application for sort of decompressing and compressing archives. So in development, we have not as much as what we're going to see in some of the other categories. We have Genie and Funny Python IDE. In education, we have the one entry of LibreOffice Math, which will be included in the overall package of LibreOffice that we'll take a look at in a moment. I'm not too sure what version it's going to be. I'm going to assume it's going to be in the sort of 6.0 release, but we'll check that out in a moment. Okay, so in games, there's going to be quite a lot of interesting stuff going on here. So we have AMR, AM2R. I'm not too sure what that is. It's the return of Seamus. We have CS2D, we have DOSBox, we've got Steam, Lutris, Multida Castilla, Minecraft Pi, QJoyPad, a Restorebox x86. So we then have Retro Pi, and I have plugged in an Xbox controller, and we can see if it's going to find that automatically. So let's go ahead and open up Retro Pi. Okay, and here we are at the screen for the Retro Pi. Now it has detected that we've got a gamepad, so if we press the A button, it should also tell us that it has detected the correct pad, which is the Xbox 360 wired pad. So I'm just going to very quickly go through the configuration there, and then I'll come back once we've done that. Okay, so our Xbox pad is fully configured, and I did have one ROM that we can use to test it out with, and it is a Nintendo 64 ROM, which of course is going to be GoldenEye. So we'll just have a quick run through here and then see if everything's working as it should. I haven't played GoldenEye in a very long time. I used to session this quite hard though when I was a lot younger. Okay, so here we are looking all nice with the old school Nintendo 64 GoldenEye. I do think I need to reconfigure my controller though because the buttons weren't quite behaving how I would have expected them to. But what we're going to do now is exit this, but we know that everything's working out of the box, which is nice to see, and we'll carry on going with some of the other applications. Okay, so that was our quick look at RetroPie. Now we're going to continue going with some of the other applications. I have quickly opened up Steam to let it do its little update in the background while we keep going. So in games, of course, we also have Steam, Update Box x86, GL4ES, Wine Configuration, Wine Desktop, and wine tricks and then we have a Z SNES installed out of the box as well. Now if we jump down into graphics we have LibreOffice Draw, a Ristretto image viewer for viewing images and then we have Photo GIMP. Now I've never actually used Photo GIMP but if I can remember what I've read it's basically GIMP with some like Photoshop-y kind of look and feels and it uses the Photoshop keyboard shortcuts. I could be completely wrong on that though but I think that's what it is but let's pop this open now so we've got a different kind of splash loading screen to the typical gimp and if we go into help and about we can see which version this is all going to be using 
so we are using GIMP version 2.10.8 so we're going to keep moving now and go into internet so we have two web browsers. We have the Chromium Media Edition, which will make things like watching Netflix and stuff a whole lot easier. We then have our Chromium web browser. We have Discord installed out of the box. And we have the Twister OS web app. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so it's opening up a little window here in Chromium. And it's got games, utilities, multimedia, and social media. Okay, this is quite interesting. So we have some kind of like little games here like Bejeweled. I do believe that's Cut the Rope. We have Candy Bubble and we also have Toon Raider so we can open Lara. And now in multimedia, we have bflix.to, we have a YouTube. Let's open up Netflix and see how that looks in its own little window. So it's going to open up in a separate window and there we go. And of course it's going to remove things like your title bar and stuff that you would see in your typical web browser. And then we have Hulu, Spotify and Anime Suge. Suge. Now in social media, we also have a web apps for Discord as well as the desktop application, Kiwi, Facebook Messenger, Reddit, Telegram, Skype, Teams, Zoom, WhatsApp, Instagram, and TikTok, and Element.io. Now if we just finish off in utilities, we have Shortwave Radio, Redax Sounds, BandLab, Gmail, Google Translate, ProtonMail, which is quite handy, and then we have Wolfram, Google Earth, Scratch, Petra, Pixel R, Pixel LR, and Outlook. So these are all web based applications. So let's keep going now. So that is pretty much everything in internet. So in multimedia, we have Audacious, Kodi, MPV Media Player, Parole Media Player, and VLC Media Player. So I'm not sure we're going to need all of those media players. So if it was me going to be using this, I'd probably remove most of these and just keep VLC. Okay, so we've now got into the office part of it. So here's the whole LibreOffice suite of applications and the mail client that is going to be using is Evolution, which is actually my favorite kind of desktop email client that you can get on Linux. I've used it quite a bit, but we're gonna leave that there. We're not gonna set up any emails. I'm sure you've all seen Evolution before. And now we're gonna jump into the LibreOffice writer and see which version we are using. So I think that's the old splash screen. So I think we are gonna be on the sort of 6.0 release, but we'll check that out once this is loaded. Okay, and it's now loaded. It took a little while, but if we jump straight into about LibreOffice, we can have a look at what version we are indeed using. Yeah, so as I thought, it's quite an old version now, version 6.1.5.2. A little bit laggy now. I'm noticing a little bit of sort of slowdown and hang ups as we're sort of traversing through. So at the moment we've got LibreOffice running and Steam is doing its update. But now those characters that I've just typed have now appeared. And as you can see, we do have dictionary autocorrect support installed out of the box. Well, let's keep going. So we're not going to save that one. And now let's go into settings. Oh, it's quite a lot here. A lot of this is going to be XFCE stuff. But as you'll notice, there is some Pi kind of specific stuff thrown in there. So of course we have appearance, we have dynamic wallpaper, open box configuration manager, we have the Pi app settings, power manager, settings editor, settings manager, theme twister, which we've taken a look at. And then of course we have the windows manager tweaks and windows manager. And if we go into tweaks, you will notice that the compositor is enabled, which will give you those like transparency effects and all of that good stuff. So we're going to finish up in system now. So we have Bleachbit installed out of the box, which is a little system cleaner to clear things like your cache and all of that good stuff. So if we open that up, as you can see here, we can then go through all of these applications and sort of places it has to the left, and it will go through that and sort of delete files. So at the moment, we've got it on default for apt, but let's also get rid of some temporary files. Yep, and we're also gonna go ahead and get rid of any backup files. Yep, and let's also clear our cache for the system, and let's also, clear our rubbish bin and temporary files so now when we press this little trash button here it's going to go through that delete all of those files and just sort of clean up your system a little bit so you can see here that it's now recovered a total of 137 MB and that makes 148 files deleted so it's quite a handy little application bleach bit I've used it here and there in my time with Linux and now let's keep going with system so we have Gparted, which is of course more of an advanced disk manager as opposed to known disks, which is also installed. We then have HTOP, and we're gonna check out how much RAM this thing uses on a fresh boot in just a moment. And then we have Onboard, Performance, PyKiss again, PowerSave, RetroPy once more, 
the Funa file manager, and then we have the Twister OS patcher. So if we open up this one, we already know that we're on the latest patch, but as you can see there, it's gonna open it up and let you know that you are on the current version or whether you need to update it. So what we're gonna do now is do a reboot and see how much RAM this uses on a fresh boot. And I'm quite intrigued to see because it's got quite a lot installed and a lot of things going on out of the box. Okay, so we're back on a fresh reboot and we've just opened up HTOP and it's looking pretty decent to be fair as far as RAM usage on a fresh boot. So we're using under 400 at around about 378. And when you consider just how much this does come pre-installed with and all of the little things that you can do, that really is quite impressive. It's also made us a small swap partition there of 100 MB. Now to wrap things up, we're gonna test it out with one or two little Windows 32-bit applications. So I've already installed a couple, so let's give it a go. So I already know that one doesn't work, so if we jump into the downloads here, we did try and get iTunes to work, the 32-bit application, but it doesn't wanna run. So if we go onto our accessories, we have a cool little spotlight search here, which is gonna open up in the top right, and it will also show your applications installed this way, sort of in your application launcher via a search. So for example, if we typed in iTunes, as you can see there, we do indeed have iTunes. However, because we don't have the iTunes helper, it's not gonna actually launch it, but I'm not too fussed about that one. Anyway, we do have Rufus though, which we had a bit more luck with. So we're gonna double click that and see what happens when we do that with Rufus. Okay, so as you can see, Rufus, the ISO image writer, has opened up absolutely fine. However, we do get an issue with iTunes, but who really cares about iTunes? I think I'm gonna wrap it up there. There is a lot for me to still take a look at, so I'm gonna keep an SD card with this one on. But overall, I think this is one of the better distributions that I've checked out that's made for the Raspberry Pi. I'll leave a link in the description below if you'd like to check it out yourself. I'll definitely recommend it. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe and join the Discord. There'll be a link in the description. I'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.